Dobrý den, dovolte mi představit našeho hosta, ředitele Centra pro tomistická studia na Univerzitě Tomáše Akvinského v Justnu, doktora Tomase Osborna, který je odborníkem na středověkou filozofii, metafyziku, etiku a filozofii akce. Mezi lety 2006 až 2010 byl mezinárodním sekretářem Americké katolické filozofické asociace a je také držitelem mnoha ocenění, jmenovitě ceny kardinála Karla Journeta za knihu Human Action in Thomas Aquinas, John Don Scotus and William of Ockham z roku 2015. Hello, doctor. Uh, Hello. Welcome at our university. Thank you that you find out time and uh, that you arrived to visit us. And let me ask you a few questions. Well, this is your first of Czech Republic. What was the biggest surprise once you, uh, you have arrived? The biggest surprise? Oh, I, I don't. The Czech Republic is filled with such kind and uh, open people, and also that they are so very proud of their heritage and their beer, and their moderation in drinking the beer. It's been very, very interesting to me. Thank you. <laughs> well, and uh, I remember you have some experience with European educational system, for example, and uh, experience with American educational mm -hmm. system. Could you compare both of them? Well, I, I think it differs a bit depending on the part of Europe, but in general, Europeans specialize a little bit earlier and there's sometimes a closer connection with the major and the job. Whereas in America, we have a lot more courses that are sometimes called core courses. And so people will often take courses throughout the curriculum and specialize much later, and they'll have to go on to law school or med school. So for instance, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor in America, you can very often be a philosophy major, especially for law, but also for medicine. And then you take the requisite courses for medicine and none for law. And after your degree in philosophy, you then get a degree afterwards in medicine or law. At least in some parts of Europe, I'm not sure about the Czech Republic, you need to know right when you go into college whether you want to be a lawyer or a doctor, a medical doctor. So I think that's a substantial difference. Um, and also the Catholic liberal arts tradition, I think, is something that you don't have as much in Europe. So there's a liberal arts college that we have in the liberal arts tradition in universities where you study the liberal arts most generally We've had a long history of having a Catholic school system where everybody studies philosophy and theology, and that's considered being part of a part of being an educated Catholic layperson is to know philosophy and theology. That's declined a lot since Vatican II, but it still remains uh, in, in some ways at different colleges. I don't think that it's quite the same in most countries in Europe. Well, I have another question. You did visit undergraduate study in the year 1994, summa cum laude, and I would like to ask you, why did you decide to do philosophy? Well, I was concerned with the most important issues in human life, action and behavior, with the most fundamental issues about what exists in the world. And it seemed to me at the time that philosophy, at least you need to do philosophy before you do theology, and the, uh, and so that's why I focused on philosophy first, and I never really moved on to the higher things. So, I'm not questioning the superiority of theology, I was just started in philosophy and didn't move beyond. And why medieval philosophy then? Well, medieval philosophy, I think, captures and develops a lot of what's true in the ancient philosophical tradition. So I like to think of philosophy as a way of inquiry, but also an accomplishment. We've learned more and more over the centuries, and you can see the growth of human knowledge 
in the development of philosophy, and especially medieval philosophy. In your personal life, uh, you have quite a big family. Is it uh, hard to be, uh, to be an academic and father in the same time? I should say that I, I think there's a difference in Europe and America. In America, at least in, in Catholic circles, it's very common to have five children or more. And often people have very busy jobs. I have a friend who's a partner in a law firm, a very large law firm, several friends who are partners in law firms who work many hours and have five or more children. Uh, it, is, it is difficult finding the time to work and devote to scholarship. Um, I think everybody has to balance their family life their personal life, and the personal life includes not only family, but your spiritual life as well. And it's hard to, to balance them, but you have to realize that your duties to your family usually come first. Family is the basic unit of society. How your kids need you more than other people do. So ultimately, it's a matter of balance and using your time well, but you have to have a priority such that first it's your wife, then it's your kids, then it's your job. I think that's not just for the academic world. I think that goes for anything else though as well. I mean, maybe in certain cases, if your job calls on you to save the world or something, and you have to leave your family for a year to do so, but most of us, it's a matter of living and having priorities and using our time well so that we can make sure that we look after our families. Scholastic philosophy. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Could you explain it to the listeners? Well, scholastic philosophy, we call it scholastic because it comes from the schools. It was done and developed in universities, institutions of highly developed intellectual rigor, uh, training. So it's the theology that comes out of the schools of the Middle Ages. And it's, I think, characterized by rigor, attention to logic, language, and an openness to studying everything. So there are different areas, different disciplines, but in scholastic philosophy, they aren't isolated or sealed off from each other. And it's ultimately out of scholastic philosophy that most of our modern disciplines arose. Uh, for instance, Father Wallace and uh, William Wallace in America uh, is a Thomist, and he wrote a lot about Galileo and how Galileo's reasoning uh, rose out of his understanding of Aristotle and scholastic method. Well, and can medieval philosophy say something to us? Well, I think, I, I, I think of course, it can in the same way that ancient philosophy can, and even more so, because it's a disciplined way of thinking about the world, uh, and it was part of a tradition where later figures built on earlier figures, and these were some of the brightest people that have ever lived uh, the, in one of the best educational systems that, that, that ever existed. On the other hand, there are very many areas where we can't learn all that much, and so maybe we can learn about scientific method from medieval philosophy or the way that it was the source of it but we aren't going to learn much about particular drugs or particular ways of building bridges. So what we can learn from them is mostly limited to things that they discussed and a way of doing things, a way of approaching things through reason, with order, with method. And then there are certain areas where their discussions haven't been surpassed, especially in the philosophy of religion, I think certain areas of theology. But there are other areas where we don't have much to learn. Certain particular sciences 
some historical areas. You focus in your work to, on Thomas Aquinas. Why is he so unique as a philosopher? Well, Thomas is important because he represents both the beginning of a philosophical period and the end of one. At his time, the universities had already developed to some extent the head curricula, the scholasticism had developed in the schools and in the monasteries of the, of the previous century. But in Thomas's time, Aristotle's works were translated and made available, along with many other works from Greek philosophy. So it was a special time where the educational institutions, the way of disputing, the, 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 the whole developed institutional uh, formation had really come about and then it was a fertile ground for Aristotle's works to, to be received. And so we find in Thomas a man of genius living at the right moment when there were the educational institutions and the works uh, newly translated available to him so that he could pull things together and systematize much of what had existed in different fragments in the Christian Fathers, East and West, in Greek philosophy, and, and especially in Aristotle, but also in Neoplatonism, the Hellenistic philosophy that arose later and influenced many of the Greek Fathers. So he's really a depository of ancient philosophy and theology, and, and patristic theology, it's where it all comes together. And I don't think it's ever been surpassed. At the time, his influence was limited to fewer people, members of his own order mostly. But as time rose, time passed, more and more people found his philosophy appealing. So it spread outside the Dominican order. In the 16th century, he became a universal doctor there were still other schools. You didn't have to be a Thomist. Then with Europe, with secularization, with war, with the results of the French Revolution, Catholic institutions were destroyed. And for political reasons, scholasticism died. When you had the revival of these institutions in the 19th century, probably I think one of the most deepest, most interesting popes of modern times, Leo XIII, drew our attention to the importance of Thomas Aquinas' philosophy for the current age as something appealing not just to Catholics, but people in general. So I think that it really has value both uh, because of what he did at the time and also the way that his thought developed and, and this value grew to be was recognized more and more after he died through the centuries it grew in importance. The Summa, Theolo the Summa Theologiae, which is probably the most famous part of, of uh, Thomas Aquinas' work, is mostly a textbook of theology. Uh, why it is so important for philosophy? Well, you know, we do have some people, especially in America, Thomas, who think that we should have our intellectual formation mostly through reading Thomas's commentaries on Aristotle's philosophical works. But it's true that the Summa Theologiae is his most developed work in which he's speaking in his own voice, maybe his disputed questions as well, but the Summa Theologiae is well-ordered and consistent. And there are philosophical arguments and ideas in there that I don't say can be torn out of context completely, but which have value in philosophy. The problem is we don't find them in a philosophical order in the Summa Theologiae. And it really is a work of, well, it's a work of theology. So it can be hard to 
know exactly how to do philosophy according to the mind of Thomas. And different philosophers have different approaches. In America, it's interesting. You have people now who do what they call philosophical theology, and they say it's philosophy, but you're using data from Revelation. And it's not always clear how that differs from scholastic theology to me, but they call it philosophy. But I'm not sure why it isn't theology. What role does uh, Thomism play in uh, a recent situation in US philosophy, generally? Mm -hmm. Well, in general, Thomism is not the dominant force in contemporary philosophy. It plays a role mostly among a, a group. First, among Catholics, certain Catholic philosophers, it's, a, it's an important philosophical tradition. Second, it has an influence on other groups of philosophers. So, for instance, Philippa Foote, who writes on virtue ethics, is heavily influenced by Thomas Aquinas, but you would call her a Thomist. So, you have different groups. You have Thomists who, you have those who call themselves Thomists, many of whom don't stick closely to Thomas's work, but try to do philosophy the way that Thomas would do philosophy. And sometimes they interact with and influence uh, the wider philosophical community in different ways. And they can be major figures, although certainly not dominant. I'm thinking of figures such as uh, Alistair McIntyre and John Finnis. You have those who are influenced by Thomas Aquinas. You have Thomists as well who often focus on the history or at the accuracy of, of, of understanding, understanding Thomas's particular thought. So what did Thomas actually say on a particular issue, rather than how do we understand the issue from a Thomistic perspective? That's more historical. Um, and you have all sorts of combinations between the two. And sometimes it's hard to know whether some people are historians of Thomas Aquinas, or whether they're Thomists, right? So in other words, it could be unclear whether people are arguing whether Thomas was right, or whether something was Thomas's position, but I think the two issues need to be kept separate. The medieval philosophy was written hundreds of years ago by people who lived in those times. Can this philosophy say something about the contemporary world? Well, it can say something about the world at all. So the world insofar as the world that we exist now has trees, plants, air, motion, change, kinds of things, language, so insofar as there, as in, in many ways the world is the same, a lot of the medieval discussions have not been surpassed in talking about language, logic, metaphysics, what really is. Also, you can apply medieval philosophy to current realities. So, for instance, you find that in the work of McIntyre and Finnis, in theology and Pinkers, those who apply medieval ideas to contemporary problems. You can also develop issues in ways that were never developed by those in medieval philosophy. But in all of these cases where you're developing or adapting to something new, it's hard to know sometimes with doing philosophy as medieval philosophy or doing the history of medieval philosophy ends and where just doing philosophy begins. There's not always a, a clear division between doing the history of philosophy and doing philosophy. But certainly there's a lot that we can learn from the history of philosophy and in that there's a lot that we can just learn about doing philosophy if you think the two can be separated. 
What was the reason for revival of Thomist philosophy? The revival in the 19th century? Well, it was just that the Pope at the time had noticed that, there, that philosophy and theology after the French Revolution just didn't have a, a strong basis, intellectual basis. The philosophy was insufficient. It couldn't deal with current problems. Often people took little bits from Kant, little bits from here and there. There was no consistent worldview, nothing that could really give substance to theology, nothing that could really give an adequate response to contemporary problems. So Leo XIII, under the influence of some Italian Thomists, draw our attention to the works of Thomas Aquinas. I think that his call, to some extent, showed the fruitfulness of Thomas Aquinas' thought. The fact that figures such as Etienne Gilson or Jacques Maritain could shed light on so many philosophical problems by being steeped in the thought of Thomas Aquinas that shows you something about his foresight. Um, and it's arguable that a lot of the problems that happened since Vatican II happened because people weren't paying attention to Thomas Aquinas, or at least some of his insights. And it was interesting in the United States, there was for a time an increase in Thomas Aquinas's reputation among non-Catholics in the 70s at the same time as his importance was decreasing among Catholics. And some of that was just people wanting to be fashionable. Ralph McInerney recalls talking to a colleague at another institution who just gave him a phone call and said, I am now interested in contemporary philosophy of language. I'm no longer a Thomist. And McInerney had studied contemporary philosophy of language. He wasn't really too much against it. He wasn't sure why you would want to say that you're not going to be a Thomist and you're going to study it. And he asked the person what he knew about it, and he said, oh, I don't know anything about it. I'm going to read a book or two, but I've just decided this is what I'm doing. And that was kind of the atmosphere of the time where people just started holding ideas because they were fashionable or interesting uh, as a group or as a, I don't know, rather than out of sincere intellectual conviction or interest. And it was a, and that's been a problem for philosophy and theology since. People are more interested in fashion rather than in serious inquiry. Why do you think that Thomistic philosophy is not outdated? Well, in some respects, it is outdated, I think. There are areas, problems brought up by Frege or Wittgenstein that are very hard to know how to address in contemporary in Thomistic philosophy. Is that saying that Thomism is outdated? Or Thomas's basic insights? I don't think so. Um, insofar as philosophy provides us with some kind of knowledge or some awareness about the world, then Thomistic philosophy is valuable and continues to be valuable over time. It doesn't mean that we're always going to understand every issue or solve every problem by looking at the texts of Thomas. But it should be, I think there should be some continuity in philosophy over time. But there are different people with different views about the history of philosophy. You have this in the history of science, for instance. Some people see modern science as radically discontinuous with medieval science. Others, such as Wallace and Weisheipel, see the developments, the continuity, the similar ways of thinking about proof and demonstration, and argue that this is more, a more helpful way of reading the history of science, but also seeing how it fits in with philosophy. I would fall in with that latter group. I think that from the perspective of Thomistic and Aristotelian philosophy, you can give an account of how human knowledge grows. You can show a kind of uh, growth and consistency over time. 
I don't think that knowledge increases through revolutions. I think generally it's a process of inquiry and even when there is a kind of disruption, like we see in the thought of Thomas Aquinas, it's not like he overthrew Aristotle's thought or he overthrew Augustine's thought. He showed how things fit together. He gave a more comprehensive account of what had been previously known. And I think any philosophy that really teaches us something would have to give a comprehensive account of what Thomas Aquinas and his followers have taught us, as well as what other philosophers have taught us, or if they've made mistakes, why and how. How do you see the work of Czech philosophers, Czech Thomists, and in the international scene? Well, it's surprising to me that there has been so much work, in particular, uh, uh, and in particular, so much work on late scholasticism. I first was exposed to it through the American Catholic Philosophical Association. I think maybe with Daniel Hyder, and then I've met through international meetings, Thomas Matula, uh, and there's and several other Czech philosophers, and they were doing work of a very high quality. Um, and, but in a way, not fitting in with the traditions in France, Germany, England, and America something a little different as well. I think it's a real contribution because they've shown how late scholasticism can be valuable in conversation and developing ideas and problems brought up by contemporary philosophy in the English-speaking world. If you look at Studio Neo Aristotelica, that gives you an example of a, of a of the kind of work that they've inspired and is being done. It's not entirely different from analytical Thomism or the different kinds of medieval work in medieval philosophy in North America, but nevertheless, it's distinct and it's of high quality and uh, surprising. Just because you wondered where there was a country without a tradition of Catholic universities recently, I think because of communism. And then you have this uh, very high quality of work coming fairly close after the Velvet Revolution in a country that is only 10% Catholic. Uh, so you wondered where did this interest in scholasticism come from? And that, well, how does it flourish here? It's remarkable, I think. I think it shows the remarkable character of, of uh, some of the earlier figures here. And in the 90s especially. Actually, you've already nearly answered my next question. How do you know our university? Oh, through Thomas Batchelor. Uh, and others, and the journal that, that they have here, really it's, it's remarkable to have this kind of international visibility uh, for neo-scholasticism, and they're very well connected to different groups. Often in America, the different, even different kinds of Thomists are isolated from each other. Whereas here, you can see connections with this university and the University of Navarre, people in England, in Britain, uh, various different groups in North America. There's really a lot of contact, not just with different countries, but with different kinds of scholars, different groups in different countries. So it's, it's, it's something admirable. And what do you like in Czech Republic most? What do I like in Czech Republic the most? Oh, well, I'm inclined to say what? I mean, 
I'm not going to say the hockey or the beer. I would say the interest, the huge interest in late scholastic philosophy and theology. Well, thank that, you. That, I think, makes the Czech Republic distinctive. <laughs> and we now, you know, in all seriousness, to have an environment for that, it, that, that is something. And then as a country, it's interesting because it has such links with, with different groups, with Austria, with Germany, with Eastern Europe. Uh, it, it's, it's like a country with one foot in Western Europe and one foot in Eastern Europe. And I think it's capable of being culturally a kind of bridge and reviving or spreading different elements of, of Western culture, of, of conserving them and keeping them in a way that other countries can't or haven't done. God willing. And will you, will you visit us again? I hope so. I would love to. We will be looking forward to you. Okay. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. And I hope you will enjoy your time here in Czech Republic. Thank you.